Well, here we roll. Welcome, everybody. My name is Marty Mascari. I am um, with the North Central Texas Area Agency on Aging and the North Central Texas Aging and Disability Resource Center. I'm a contractor with them. Um, and uh, they are in the Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas area under the umbrella of the North Central Texas Council of Governments. I'm blessed here to have Donnie um, Green, who is um, the director of the uh, Area Agency on Aging and Aging and Disability Resource Center, and Courtney Ranger from the Alzheimer's Association here to talk about um, services for people with dementia and their family caregivers. But before we get started, we're going to go quickly over the CEU requirements for today. We're offering complimentary CEUs to licensed social workers and licensed professional counselors in the state of Texas. Uh, please note that if you have a different license in Texas and you have, or you have a license outside of Texas, you're more than welcome to go through the process, get um, a certificate, and submit it to the jurisdiction um, that you um, uh, answer to. But please note that there's no guarantee that they'll take it. We're set up um, for these two. Um, we're also um, offering certificates of attendance for anybody who um, is interested in getting one. Today's webinar will be worth one hour of CEU credits. You must attend the entire um, webinar and the Q&A uh, for the hour in order to, um, to qualify. If we go over the hour, you're not obligated to stay beyond um, the time of, uh, set for the webinar. Um, you must complete also complete the Google evaluation survey. When you log out of Zoom, it should ask you if you'd, be, if you'd like to take a short survey. That will take you to our Google survey. Um, but if you don't receive that, no worries. You'll also get that in a follow-up email to me that will go out after today's webinar. Um, the Google survey will be um, up and alive for, um, for a week until um, the third. And then please give us about four weeks after that to get those certificates out to you all. So I'm going to turn it over to Donnie Green. Excellent. Thank you, Marty. And um, it's my pleasure to be joined today by Courtney Ranger. Marty told you a little bit about me. Let me share a little bit about Courtney. Uh, she is the Director of Programs and Services for the uh, Dallas and Northeast Texas Chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. Courtney holds a Master's of Public Health from UT Health and has 15 years of working with community organizations and in higher education to create sustainable cross-sector partnerships that fulfill unmet needs in the community. So um, everyone will receive a copy of these slides, so don't worry um, about taking any notes, but here's a taste of um, the topics that we'll be covering in the next hour. Uh, we'll talk about um, services funded by Medicare, Medicaid, Texas Health and Human Services Commission, Veterans Administration, the Alzheimer's Association, Texas Area Agencies on Aging, Aging and Disability Resource Centers, and Adult Protective Services. So let me start with Medicare and frankly, Medicare coverage uh, of services for people with dementia is pretty limited. Um, so Medicare will cover home health as well as skilled nursing um, facility rehabilitation services, but there are a lot of uh, limitations on both of those services. So starting with home health, uh, the coverage tends to be pretty short term in nature. Um, it is tied to that need for skilled care and skilled care is care that can only be provided by a licensed professional. Um, if somebody needs help with getting out of bed, taking a bath, getting dressed, um, that's not considered skilled in nature. And all Medicare home health services must be provided by agencies that are under contract with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, the skilled nursing facility, facility rehabilitation benefit um, can be accessed um, in most cases only after um, spending three days in the hospital. Um, but there are some exceptions for people who are enrolled in Medicare Advantage plans. And again, um, the beneficiary must require skilled care, um, just requiring help with uh, daily um, activities of daily living is not sufficient. Um, coverage is limited to 100 days per benefit period. The reality is most, most people um, receive far fewer than the 100 days. And it's important to note that dementia is not 
an exclusionary criterion. So people with dementia certainly can be approved uh, for skilled nursing facility uh, rehabilitation services, but um, sometimes their, their family members really need to advocate. So um, I will save that topic for another day <laughs> and turn now to Medicaid, which um, does a much better job of covering long-term services and supports. And there are um, several Medicaid programs that, um, that may provide long-term services and supports. And I'd like to start with people who receive full Medicaid benefits. And when I say full Medicaid, I'm referring to those who are receiving supplemental security income or SSI checks. Um, so um, in Texas, adults who receive SSI are enrolled in STAR Plus and they get um, any long-term services and supports from their health plan. And there are a couple of Medicaid programs that can be accessed through the health plans. Um, the first is the primary home care program, uh, which goes by the acronym PHC. There's also an adult day activity health services or um, DOS benefit. And um, both of those programs can be requested through the health plan that is responsible for those Medicaid services. So if you know somebody who is receiving full Medicaid services and they're in need of um, long-term services, um, they or you can contact the service coordinator with that Medicaid health plan. And we get a lot of questions from family members who want to be paid providers. And through the STAR Plus Medicaid program, that's pretty easily doable. Um, but the point of contact would be that service coordinator to get somebody approved for services and then um, to make arrangements for the family member or friend or neighbor um, to be the paid provider through the consumer directed service option. There are some um, additional services that people who receive Medicaid benefits may um, be eligible for, um, but um, the Star Plus waiver does have um, both financial and medical requirements. Um, those who qualify for the Star Plus waiver can be considered for lots and lots of different um, long-term services, including help with housekeeping, help with personal care. Um, they may be approved for Meals on Wheels, uh, medical equipment and supplies that are not covered by insurance. So things like adaptive equipment, um, elevated toilet seats or grab bars. Um, they may be approved for personal emergency response devices that will place a call. In case of an emergency, um, they can pay for minor home modifications that are necessary for health or safety. Um, so the most common modifications that would be covered by the Star Plus waiver include um, building wheelchair ramps, installing grab bars, widening bathroom doorways. Uh, the Star Plus waiver can also pay for respite care that will relieve family caregivers so that they can take a break. And um, it is the only Medicaid program in the state of Texas that can pay for care in an assisted living facility. So those are some of the benefits that may be available. This is not a complete list. Um, uh, the, the beauty of the Star Plus waiver is it has a lot of um, flexibility and a number of services that may be authorized um, based on the person's individual needs. So let's talk a little bit about how people qualify for the STAR Plus waiver. As I mentioned, there are both financial as well as medical requirements. So let me start with the financial. Um, there are income limits and there are resource limits. So in terms of income, a single person can have no more than $2,829 a month in income. So that would include social security, uh, pensions. Um, married couples can have up to double that amount. 
Uh, so um, for 2024, the couple's income limit is $5,658 a month. If there's somebody who meets all of the requirements for STAR Plus waiver, um, but has higher income, there is a legal way to, um, to put a portion of the income into a special trust for the purpose of qualifying for waiver services. And, um, and if you need more information, um, I would encourage you to contact your Area Agency on Aging um, Benefits Counselors, and I'll provide a phone number um, a little later in the presentation. In terms of resources, so single people can have no more than $2,000 in resources, and resources would include checking accounts and savings accounts and other assets that can easily be converted to cash, so a certificate of deposit um, stocks and bonds would be considered resources. In most cases, the homestead is not considered a resource. Um, so $2,000 limit for a single person, $3,000 limit for a married couple. Um, if both husband and wife are applying for Medicaid services, but um, if there's a married couple and only one requires Medicaid services or only one requires uh, nursing home care, there are quite a few protections that will um, allow the person who remains in the community to keep um, about half of the resources subject to minimums and maximums. And um, again, if you need more information about that, the Area Agency on Aging Benefits Counselors can um, help explain that. And then we've also written a publication called Understanding Your Options for Care in a Nursing Home or Assisted Living Facility. And in that booklet, we've um, provided information about those protections for married couples. So um, in addition to those financial eligibility criteria, um, the person must also qualify medically for nursing home care. That doesn't mean that the person has to go into a nursing home um, in order to be approved for waiver services, but um, the, the state or the health plan would have to do an assessment and determine if that person uh, requires the services of a licensed nurse or somebody acting under the direct supervision of a licensed nurse. So um, in terms of making application for STAR Plus waiver benefits, it varies depending on whether the person is receiving um, those full Medicaid benefits that come with getting a supplemental security income or SSI check. So if somebody is getting full Medicaid benefits, um, they would reach out to their Medicaid health plan and in Texas, those plans include um, Molina, Superior, uh, United, WellPoint, and um, talk to the service coordinator and request what's called an upgrade assessment. Um, so um, that's a pretty um, quick and um, easy process for those who qualify. Um, the process is very different for those people who aren't already receiving full Medicaid benefits. So in that case, um, in Texas, the person would have to go on an interest or wait list for STAR Plus waiver services. And um, if you contact the Aging and Disability Resource Center at 855-937-2372, um, they can give you the number for your regional um, office for the Health and Human Services Commission where you can uh, request to be placed on the STAR Plus waiver um, interest list. Um, the, the wait list varies in length, but generally um, it runs between six months and a year or so. Um, so advanced planning is, is um, really key. Um, not everybody has the luxury of, of planning in advance, but 
um, just be aware that there, there may be a significant interest or wait list. There are other services that are funded through the Health and Human Services Commission that can provide um, in-home services for those who qualify. And uh, with these programs, there are both um, financial and medical requirements. So this is not a complete list of services that are funded by the Health and Human Services Commission, but these are kind of the major programs. And they include the Community Attendant Services Program. And that program can pay for housekeeping as well as personal care. Uh, the state also funds home delivered meals, um, personal emergency response services that help I'm, I've fallen and I can't get up uh, devices. Um, it too can pay for day activity and health services um, through facilities that contract with the Medicaid program. And then it also has a family care program. Um, as I've noted, all but community attendance services have lengthy wait lists. And um, again, the duration will vary, but uh, last time I checked the wait list for those programs um, was running um, in excess of a year or two years. Um, so community attendance services is, um, is a wonderful program and um, it's fairly unique in terms of not having um, a lengthy interest list. So um, the financial requirements for those Health and Human Services Commission services are the same as for the STAR Plus waiver. And um, so in terms of income, single person can have no more than $2,829 a month. Married couples can have no more than $5,658 a month. These programs have slightly different rules. And one of the major differences is if people are over income, they just don't qualify for the services. Unfortunately, that, um, that qualifying income trust is not an option for these programs. In addition to the income limit, the same resource limits are in effect. So for a single person, no more than $2,000. Uh, for married couples, no more than $3,000 in resources. Um, and that's for the community attendance services program. Uh, the other programs I mentioned have slightly higher resource limits and specifically $5,000 for a single person and $6,000 for a married couple. Um, that's a lot of information that I've thrown at you um, pretty quickly. Um, there's not a test at the end of the program. And um, just know that um, if you're in the state of Texas and you call 855-937-2372, a benefit specialist will talk to you about your situation and um, do their very best to screen to see what public programs may be available. And um, they can also make referrals to, um, to other programs as well. Alrighty, I'm gonna turn now from the Health and Human Services Commission and um, Medicaid funded programs and, um, and just encourage anyone who needs help, who may qualify for services through the Veterans Administration to either contact the VA or um, the County Veterans Service Officer. So in the state of Texas, there are County Veterans Service Officers who work for the counties and their jobs are to connect their residents with programs through the Veterans Administration. So they can help explain programs, they can um, help people um, complete and submit applications, and um, that's a service that's available at no charge um, through your county. So um, some of the major programs, and again, this is not a complete list, there are other um, programs available through the VA, um, but they include um, home-based primary care. Um, similar to the Medicaid programs, the VA will pay for housekeeping. It will pay for personal care if somebody needs help um, getting out of bed, getting dressed, taking a bath, um, toileting, grooming, feeding. 
um, the VA has programs that can assist. The VA also um, can help pay for adult day um, health or activity services. Uh, the VA has a wonderful aid and attendance program. And for people who qualify, um, the veteran and or the dependent receives an additional pension that can be used to pay for care in the home, care in an assisted living facility, or care in a nursing facility. Um, so there are some uh, financial requirements, but they're not as restrictive as those Medicaid um, income and resource limits that I mentioned. Uh, for aid and attendance, the VA is just looking at uh, total net worth. Um, in addition, the aid and attendance program uh, requires that the veteran served at least one day during a wartime period. In addition to the aid and attendance program, the VA also has a program of comprehensive assistance for family caregivers, a wonderful program that's fairly new um, that can provide um, in-home services and um, kind of financial relief to the veteran and the family caregiver. And uh, one of the programs that is rapidly expanding is the Veterans Directed Care Program. Um, it's not yet available um, in the entire state of Texas or nationwide, um, but the VA has established a goal of having it available uh, nationwide within the next, I believe, year or so. And um, apart from my responsibilities with the Area Agency on Aging and Aging and Disability Resource Center, uh, we are contracting with the Veterans Administration uh, to um, implement the program in North Central Texas. So um, I'm pretty excited about that. Um, but again, if you need more information, please contact the VA or your County Veterans Service Officer. And at this point, I am going to turn the program over to Courtney Ranger, uh, who will um, provide a summary of the major services available through the Alzheimer's Association. Awesome. Thanks so much, Donnie. Um, so the Alzheimer's Association provides a range of resources for caregivers, professionals, and the general public. Um, I'll be giving a broad overview of our caregiver and professional services today but you can find more information either on our chapter website at alz.org slash Dallas any Texas, um, or you can find your local chapter at alz.org. Um, as a general note, most of our services are available in multiple formats to make the programming more accessible. So I'll start with caregiver support since it's a central part of our work at the Alzheimer's Association. Um, and we also encourage professionals to keep us in mind should they encounter patients that need support. All of our caregiver resources are available at no cost. Um, one of our most popular resources are our support groups, which are led by trained facilitators. Most of these groups meet monthly, but we have a few groups that actually meet biweekly and some, a few weekly group meetings as well. These groups not only provide support and connections for caregivers in a safe space, but they're also a great way for participants to learn more about strategies for caregiving, as well as local community resources. Again, these are available in person and virtually, and we also offer a group in Spanish to make them more accessible to those who may need them. Our in-person groups are typically held in community settings like churches or community centers, which again is really designed to help us create a welcoming and comfortable environment for the participants. We also offer education programs. Our curriculum not only addresses things like Alzheimer's and dementia awareness for the general public, but we also focus on caregiver strategies. We have recently introduced a new series for caregivers called the Empowered Caregiver, um, which was developed in partnership with caregivers and healthcare professionals. It's focused on person-centered care, building a network of support and early planning. Many of these educational sessions are actually really useful for, for professionals. Um, and we'll also work with healthcare providers to schedule caregiver sessions for their patient population. And frequently, we actually work with long-term care centers um, to speak with their staff um, about some, you know, some of the more critical topics like responding to dementia-related behaviors and also our communication resources. 
We also offer early stage engagement programs, which support social connections for people with dementia and their caregivers. They really create the opportunity to build community in a comfortable and welcoming setting. And like our other programming, we have in-person and virtual options. Um, I could talk all day about some of our, our early stage programs, so I will leave it there. <laughs> um, but, oh, awesome, thanks, Johnny. Um, so we also have a wealth of online resources, both for our caregivers and healthcare professionals. These offerings range from self-paced versions of many of the educational sessions that we provide live, as well as extensive information about the disease, caregiving strategies, and other topics of note. We have dedicated portals for caregivers at every stage of the disease, as well as for people who are recently diagnosed and the general public. I really love our brain tour. Um, I think it's a great way to open a conversation about Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, and for professionals specifically, we offer resources like dementia care practice recommendations, medical management recommendations, and our Essentials program and the ECHO program. Um, our dementia and care practice recommendations outline the recommendations for quality care practices based on a comprehensive review of current practice, current evidence, best practice, and expert opinion. Um, these recommendations were developed to better define quality care across all care settings and throughout the disease course. Um, these are published as a supplement to the gerontologist, and should anyone be interested, I'm happy to help get you connected with that information. Um, our medical management recommendations include both pharmacological and non-pharmacologic interventions, and the goals are real of this of these recommendations are to provide an environment with minimal failure and maximal use of retained abilities, limit transitions between care facilities and home, develop treatment plan strategies, and to simplify and streamline medications. For those who are working in long-term and community-based care settings like nursing homes, assisted living, and home care, we offer the Essentials De Dementia Care and Tra Training and Certification Program. It provides an evidence-based, person-centered set of care practices for people who are living with dementia, including things like the basics of Alzheimer's and dementia, person-centered care, assessment and care planning, activities of daily living, and communication changes and dementia-related behavior. We also have free first responder training through an online self-paced course. Um, this course is appropriate for people like paramedics, police officers, firefighters, and other emergency personnel. Um, like much of our other programming, it was developed with input from our key audience, which are first responders, and includes videos and interactive activities. It addresses topics like wandering, driving calls, abuse and neglect, shoplifting, and disaster response. Um, finally, we also offer CEUs as part of our local and virtual conferences, and these are announced as they are available. Um, next up, we have our ECHO program, which is designed for professional long-term care providers. Um, I think this is a really neat program and responds well to the way that healthcare and care is moving more generally. Um, it connects multidisciplinary dementia care experts with professional care providers in a free continuing education series of interactive case-based case video conferencing sessions. Um, again, it's a free program, it's six weeks, and it's really more of a mentoring program for professional care workers across the nation that aims to improve health outcomes through a team-based approach while reducing geographic barriers and the cost of care. The sessions are weekly. Um, they'll include a lesson on a particular aspect of dementia care, followed by a case discussion. Um, I think it's really neat because it allows content experts to mentor and train professional care providers on the most up-to-date best practice for caring with people with Alzheimer's and dementia. And finally, in keeping with our focus on providing the most current best practices and research, we offer regular research updates available to all professionals and the general public, as well as support for researchers. We also provide patient resources to healthcare providers and community organizations, providing an easy and reliable source of information for organizations to share with their patients or clients. Um, providers or organizations may access these resources, which include things like brochures and topic sheets covering a range of issues by reaching out to our team to chat about your specific needs. 
Um, and most critically, we also offer a 24-7 helpline, which can be reached at 1-800-272-3900. I will repeat that again. Please save it in your phones. That number is 1-800-272-3900. It's staffed by master's, master's level clinicians and in, it's available in over 200 languages. It's really a critical resource for people who are living with dementia, their caregivers, families, and the general public. And it's the best way to get connected with any of our resources. Thanks, Donnie. Excellent, thank you, Courtney. Okay, now I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about services through the Area Agencies on Aging. For those of you who are joining from other states, um, these, um, these programs are available uh, nationwide. Um, so the Area Agencies on Aging are funded by both the federal and state governments. And um, eligibility um, at its core is determined by age, um, but additional eligibility may apply, for example, for home delivered meals. Uh, in order to qualify, the person would um, have to have difficulty um, shopping for meals or preparing meals. So unlike the Medicaid programs, eligibility is not on the basis of um, income or resources, but um, even though the services are not means tested, the area agencies on aging do target people with greatest economic need, uh, greatest social need, and in fact, the Older Americans Act requires that we target people who are living with dementia. The services provided by the Area Agency on Aging vary quite a bit on the basis of local needs and the strategic plan that's been developed by the Area Agency on Aging. And like the services through the Alzheimer's Association, they're provided at no charge to those who qualify. So let's talk a little bit about the age requirements. Um, and there are um, two major categories of services through the area agencies on aging, services for older adults and services for family caregivers. So in order to qualify for services for older adults, um, the person has to be 60 years of age. Um, or to qualify for caregiver services, the person must be a qualifying caregiver. Well, what does that mean? Um, so um, for caregiver services, the caregiver must be unpaid and care for somebody who's at least 60 years of age or care for a family member of any age who has dementia, um, even if the person living with dementia and the family member are under the age of 60. Uh, the person can also qualify by being at least 55 years old and having primary custody of minors, um, people who are under the age, age 18 or younger, um, who are not biological children. So in most cases, um, the area agencies on aging would work with grandparents raising grandchildren um, under this service category, but it's not limited to grandparents. And then the, um, the other way that a person can qualify for caregiver services through the area agency on aging is to be at least 55 years old live with and care for a relative um, who's under the age of 60 who has disabilities. So we would be able to provide services to a 57-year-old woman who um, is caring for a um, adult child with cerebral palsy or um, provide services to a a uh, woman who's at least 55 years old and um, caring for her uh, for her 50 something um, husband with disabilities. In the state of Texas, there are certain services that all area agencies on aging must provide. And then there's a pretty long list of services that the area agency on aging can kind of pick and choose from. Um, the Texas mandatory services include information and referral. Uh, so similar to the helpline, uh, we have uh, staff who would uh, listen to callers' needs, try to identify resources. Unlike the helpline, um, it's available only during normal business hours. Um, 
we also fund nutrition services, and those are really the, um, the centerpiece of um, Area Agency on Aging Services. Um, in the state of Texas, the Area Agencies on Aging are the um, primary funding source for the Meals on Wheels programs. And then we also fund meals that are served at senior centers, um, community centers, in some cases, um, uh, senior living communities as well. All of the area agencies on aging have benefits counseling programs that can help people understand Medicare and Medicaid, um, case management, long-term care ombudsman, um, healthy aging classes and caregiver services. And I've got a little bit more detail about those services. Um, in addition, the area agencies on aging um, have the ability to support um, services that include transportation. Uh, we can pay for um, care at an adult day activity program. Um, we can lease the emergency response devices. We can pay for chore services. Uh, we can pay for friendly visiting and um, several other services as well. But um, I would say the most common um, discretionary services would be transportation. So nutrition services um, for home delivered meals, um, as I mentioned, there are additional eligibility criteria. So in addition to being 60 years of age, um, the person would need to have some kind of disability that makes it difficult to shop for or prepare meals um, for those who don't meet those um, medical requirements. Uh, the congregate meal program is open to anybody who's at least 60 years old, as well as spouses of people who are uh, 60 years old. And many of the um, congregate meal sites will also provide transportation as well. The Benefits Counseling Program works with Medicare beneficiaries of any age, and the program provides counseling regarding Medicare Parts A, B, C, D. Uh, it can help people understand um, whether they need to participate in Medicare if they're still working and have insurance through their employer. They can um, kind of go over the advantages and disadvantages of traditional Medicare versus Medicare Advantage. They can help people do plan comparisons for Part D prescription drug coverage. They can also help people uh, determine if they may qualify for Medicare savings programs, um, which help uh, Medicare beneficiaries hang on to their Part B premiums, and in some cases um, will uh, satisfy their Medicare co-pays. Um, they can also screen to see if people qualify for low income subsidies, which will reduce the cost of co-pays uh, for Medicare Part D prescription drugs. They are um, recognized by Texas statute to counsel people regarding advanced directives, um, healthcare powers of attorney, um, directives to physicians um, out of hospital do not resuscitate orders. And in some cases, the area agencies on aging will pay for people to see an attorney um, so that they can get their, um, their wills, their powers of attorney, and in, in some cases, qualifying income trusts in place. And um, as a reminder, the qualifying income trusts will help people who are over the Medicaid um, income limits for nursing home Medicaid um, qualify uh, financially. So um, a great tool for those people who, um, again, don't meet the um, income limits, but don't have sufficient funds that they can afford to pay privately uh, for nursing home care. The Area Agencies on Aging have case management programs, which provide short-term services um, of variable duration. Um, they um, almost never go over six months. Um, some people will receive services for um, shorter periods, sometimes a month, three months, five months. Um, the services that can be authorized by the Area Agency on Aging include in-home services, um, 
housekeeping, uh, personal care services, uh, like the STAR Plus waiver, the uh, case management program can also pay for um, minor home repairs. In most cases that are necessary for accessibility or health or safety, um, area agencies on aging can pay for medical equipment and supplies that are not covered by insurance. Uh, so if somebody um, needs incontinent supplies but uh, doesn't have Medicaid benefits, the area agencies on aging um, might be able to help pay for uh, those supplies. Um, they can pay for uh, grab bars, um, medical equipment that's used in the bathroom, uh, handheld shower nozzles, transfer benches, shower chairs. And um, in some cases, they can also provide um, limited financial assistance, usually with utility bills, sometimes with, um, with rent as well. Um, Texas area agencies on aging vary quite a bit in terms of the way that they've structured their case management programs and um, the eligibility criteria that they've developed in addition to the age requirement. And again, um, as a reminder, people have to be at least 60 years old uh, to qualify for, um, for services for older adults and case management is one of those services for older adults. The uh, AAAs all have long-term care ombudsman programs and um, these programs advocate for people who live in nursing facilities or assisted living facilities. They can also help people who are thinking about going into a long-term care facility, as well as their family members, um, locate facilities based on the care needs, their ability to pay, um, the ombudsman program does not recommend specific facilities. Um, all of the information has to be um, objective in nature, um, but the program can and will share um, information regarding um, how well facilities have done during their most recent surveys. Um, so a great source of information if people are thinking about placement at some point. To contact uh, an area agency on aging within the state of Texas, call 800-252-9240. And for participants who are uh, beyond the state of Texas, uh, they can call the elder care locator at 800-677-1116. Now I'd like to turn to a program um, that is uh, somewhat um, limited in terms of geography. And um, our uh, agency, the Council of Governments, applied to the federal government for a special grant uh, that we received uh, back in uh, to 2021. Um, but um, I do want to stress that even though it's um, it's a grant that was given to us in North Central Texas, we have gotten permission to provide the caregiver training services uh, to people throughout the state of Texas and even beyond. Um, so uh, through Dementia Friendly North Central and East Texas, we are offering uh, dementia training for professionals. We have worked on compiling resource information and we continue to build out our resource listing that's available on our website. And one of the um, handouts that you'll be receiving after this morning's webinar is um, a hard copy resource list. And um, it, um, it includes resources that are available throughout the state of Texas. Um, so for people who are beyond North Central Texas, but still within the state, um, it's, it's kind of a helpful guide uh, for people who may not have internet um, access. And um, I'm really excited about the caregiver classes uh, that we're making available through this federal grant. Um, they include um, two classes that are offered through our partner, uh, James L. West. And um, I'd, I'd like to give a shout out to James L. West and Holly Cobb Tinsley and um, Holly Glover, who've done a number of webinars with Marty 
um, through this grant, they are making available their Dementia Live program. And Dementia Live is a um, one hour simulation for family members that um, allows them to um, experience what a person living with dementia may experience. Uh, James L. West is also doing the Compassionate Touch program. Again, a, um, a one hour workshop that teaches family members how to use touch to communicate caring and calm someone who's living with dementia. These are not the only programs that James L. West makes available. And um, I would encourage you to go to their website or to call um, at the phone number listed to get more information about its training programs. Uh, through our Area Agency on Aging, we're also supporting uh, stress busting for family caregivers and uh, dealing with dementia. And James L. West is offering both of those programs. Other um, caregiver supports that are available statewide in the state of Texas include the Resources for Enhancing All Caregivers' Health or REACH program. And that's a program that assigns a dementia educator to work one-on-one -on -one with the family caregiver. And um, the dementia educator will provide information about the disease process and also uh, focus on kind of the, the one or two top stressors for that family caregiver. Um, maybe the family is dealing with wandering or uh, resistance to bathing and through the REACH program, um, the, uh, the interventionist will um, help uh, develop strategies for dealing with, um, with those expressions. And um, then one of the newest programs, the newest program under the Dementia Friendly Initiative, and again, available statewide, is Building Better Caregivers. And that's a program for small groups of um, family members who are caring for those with dementia. And they come together once a week for six consecutive weeks. And, um, and um, they learn how to develop plans for relieving their own stress, as well as um, the stress of the person living with dementia. Uh, today is the first day of our first workshop series. And I'm thrilled that we filled that group. I believe we filled a second group as well. And we are committed to scheduling as many of these workshop series um, as are needed in order to meet the need. I've provided contact information for Dementia Friendly. And again, um, you'll receive copies of these slides. The, um, the next to last program I'd like to cover is the Aging and Disability Resource Center. Um, the Aging and Disability Resource Center is not unique to Texas. Most states do have um, ADRCs, um, but not all states, most but not all. Um, in the state of Texas, the ADRCs are funded by the Texas Health and Human Services Commission, and it um, they serve people of all ages with all types of disabilities, as well as their family caregivers. The primary purpose of the ADRC is to help people um, identify long-term service and support programs. Um, and um, the ADRCs are expected to be knowledgeable about what Medicare covers, what Medicaid covers, what the VA covers, um, what the Health and Human Services Commission covers. Um, so most of um, the work is helping people kind of navigate those very complex um, public programs, but the ADRCs in the state of Texas do receive a little bit of funding for direct services as well. And um, one of the programs that is um, available through the Aging and Disability Resource Centers is Lifespan Respite. So this is a program that will provide a short-term break to family caregivers who are not being paid uh, for their caregiving, uh, who don't qualify for in-home programs through Medicare, Medicaid, VA, and so on and can't afford to pay privately. So um, 
The ADRC respite program uh, tends to be a well-kept secret and um, the area agencies on aging have respite programs. And whenever people call us, we try to get them qualified for that program. If we can't, then we see if we can get them qualified for the respite program through the Aging and Disability Resource Center. Um, so a statewide phone number for your um, Aging and Disability Resource Center is 855-937-2372. The last uh, program I'd like to mention is Adult Protective Services. And um, these services are available in all states. And um, the mission in every state is the same, uh, to investigate known or suspected abuse, neglect, um, and or exploitation of a person who's at least 50, 65 years old or um, a younger adult with disabilities. Um, I wanted to mention adult protective services um, because the most common reason that somebody would contact adult protective services is to make a report of self-neglect. And um, in some cases, a person living with dementia um, may be um, may be neglecting um, his or her own care. Um, and that's, that's um, an appropriate reason uh, for making the referral to adult protective services. Um, a caseworker will go out, will investigate, um, will kind of have the, you know, the hard job of determining whether somebody has um, capacity to make decisions um, and um, if not, can, um, can intervene. So um, I wanted to make sure that, um, that everybody has contact for Adult Protective Services. Again, this is going to be um, a state-specific phone number. So um, that brings me to the end of my slides and, um, and um, I'll do my best to respond to any questions that you all might have in the few minutes that we have remaining. Um, as Marty mentioned, um, you don't have to stay with us any longer than um, the hour that's been scheduled in order to get CEUs. Um, but if you do have questions that um, I'm not able to answer uh, before 11 o'clock, I'm happy to stay um, and um, answer those to the best of my ability. And Marty, do you wanna go ahead and talk about CEUs? And yeah. then um, let's turn to, um, to the questions if we have any. That's perfect. If you could advance a slide one, I would appreciate it. That would be great. For those of you that are um, joining us today for CEUs, um, we are offering complimentary CEUs for licensed social workers and licensed professional counselors in the state of Texas. If you have a different license in Texas or a license outside of Texas, you're more than welcome to go through the process, get a certificate and submit it to your jurisdiction. But please know there's no guarantee that they that they will take it. I've had a couple of jurisdictions actually reach out to me for, for content, course content, um, and, and I'll be happy to provide that to them if, if, if they have that question. And we're also offering certificates of, of attendance, um, at, but the um, requirements are the same. Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Today's webinar is worth one hour of CEU credits. You must have completed the entire live webinar. Um, as Donnie just said, you don't have to go past the 4.30 mark. I'm, I'm sorry, the 4.30 mark. It's 11 o'clock. I'm so sorry. Um, you, you just have to stick with us till then. Um, you, and But you also must complete the Google evaluation survey. Uh, that survey, um, Zoom should give you... Um, the option to go to that survey um, as you log out today, it should ask you if you'd like to take a short survey. You can access it there, or um, or it will also um, come in a follow up email uh, from me um, after today's webinar. Um, it'll be up and live for uh, till the third of May, and please give us about four weeks after that to get those certificates all out to you all. If if you don't receive it by then, feel free to reach out. Thank you, Marty. And I see uh, six questions um, in the Q&A, so um, let's dive into those. And Courtney, um, I'm gonna see if you can answer the, the last question first. Does the Alzheimer's Association assist with locating companion volunteers for dementia patients? 
Absolutely. This isn't a service that our chapter offers. Um, it may be something that other chapters offer. Um, I'm not sure where you're located. Um, if you are looking for respite services, though, I would encourage you to check out the Community Resource Finder at communityresourcefinder.org. Um, it's a great way to find, you know, adult day respite centers for people. Um, and, you know, it kind of, it wraps up a bunch of different community services, medical services, and also programs and events from our organization, as well as the AARP. Um, so I'm so sorry. I, I don't know specifically if some, if other chapters um, offer companion. Yeah. Uh, another good resource information if somebody is looking for respite is Take Time Texas, which is a clearinghouse of um, both public and private programs, and it kind of skews toward private. So um, sometimes you'll just have a long list of, you know, agencies that will charge for the services, but it is a good source of information. Okay, I'm going to work my way up. Is the Veterans Administration Program uh, programs available only to veterans, or are they also available to their spouses? Um, so um, most of the programs or many of the programs are available to spouses as well. Um, so I talked about aid and attendance. Dependents can qualify for aid and attendance benefits. Um, all righty, do you know if the spouse of a living veteran can receive services through aid and attendance? Yes. Um, I'm trying to get VA benefits for my mom for almost a year. It's a lot of paperwork and having to reapply several times. Yes. And again, that's one of the reasons why the county veteran service officers can be um, your best friend by kind of helping you out with that paperwork piece. Um, there are also some home health agencies that will help, but, you know, they've, they've got a profit motive, whereas that county veteran service officer does not. Okay. Um, this next question um, will take a little bit longer to answer. How do we transfer from home and community services waiver to traditional Medicaid for dementia benefits? Um, a, a person is doing well, but I'm trying to plan ahead Down syndrome with Alzheimer's. So if somebody is receiving HCS waiver, that means that that person um, is already approved for Medicaid benefits. And there are several um, waivers. The one that I talked about today is the STAR Plus waiver. Some people will qualify for two or three different waivers, um, but they have to choose the waiver that's going to be the best fit for them. Um, and that's going to be different um, for um, based on individual circumstances. So if somebody is receiving home and community services waiver, um, that waiver can pay for a group home, but it doesn't pay for care in an assisted living facility. The STAR Plus waiver can pay for care in an assisted living facility. So there are a couple of things you can do. One would be to call the um, Aging and Disability Resource Center and just say, you know, my family member is getting HCS waiver. Um, I I'd like to compare those benefits um, to those that she may receive through STAR Plus waiver. And the Aging and Disability Resource Center can help you do that. Um, in terms of transferring, what you would do is you would reach out to your Medicaid health plan. And in the state of Texas, that would be the Molina, the Superior, the WellPoint, the United, and um, just let the service coordinator know that, um, you know, I'm I, I want to be assessed for STAR Plus waiver uh, to see what benefits I could receive. And then you just want to compare those benefits. Um, the, the different waiver programs have similar benefits, but, um, but they're a little bit different. And Home and Community Services um, really focuses on um, independent living skills or habilitation services. The STAR Plus waiver really focuses on nursing care, um, and it's really intended for um, adults who have physical disabilities. A lot of us have different types of disabilities. We may have physical disabilities. We may have um, intellectual disabilities. And again, what you would need to do is just look at the different waiver benefits and figure out which one is going to be the best fit. Um, but 
it's it's pretty easy in terms of getting star plus waiver um, set up if somebody is already receiving medicaid because you would just need to talk to your health plan service coordinator marty those are the only questions that i'm seeing in um, i just want to make sure that i answered correctly um there was a one in the chat about um a family member that was um um it's it's from Ch chantal um about um helping with a family member and i assume that it it was at 10 45 just to give you a, a time frame of where it is in the chat okay but let me see I'm assuming adult it. protective services was the um is the appropriate answer to that okay Yes, I see it. Um, can you recommend um, anything to help a family of limited income trying to seek an attorney to help them gain guardianship of their 70-year-old mother who has dementia but refuses all care and entering a nursing home or assisted living facility? So yes, um, I would suggest making a referral to Adult Protective Services because, um, you know, their investigation can kind of um, lead the family in the right direction. Um, Adult Protective Services can make referrals to guardianship programs. Uh, so if it would be difficult for the family to pay privately, um, I would certainly um, want to tap into that resource first, um, both for the investigation as well as the possibility of any funding. Um, beyond that, um, the um, our area agency on aging used to provide um, some funding for guardianship and our federal agency um, actually told us we can't do that anymore, that we can help people um, ensure and restore their rights, but we can't take any action to remove their rights. Um, I, I would suggest calling the area agency on aging if um, you know, if going through adult protective services doesn't help, um, unfortunately, we can't provide funding. But, you know, some larger counties will have um, probate courts, um, may have um, some funding for guardianship, uh, not too many do. Of Texas's 254 counties, I think only the largest counties um, actually have um, formal supports, but um, the Area Agency on Aging will, uh, will do its best to try to identify um, any sources of help, can also provide referrals to um, elder law attorneys as well. There, there's a comment just before that. I don't know if we've got that answered from Maria York. Can someone have VA services once eligible and also through services um, through the Aging and Disability Resource Center? So the Aging and Disability Resource Center respite program is really intended to be a program of last resort. Um, the funding is extremely limited. And um, just to give you an idea of the scope, uh, our Aging and Disability Resource Center serves 14 counties. We get uh, about $40,000 a year, so not much money. So in general, we would not be able to provide respite services to somebody who's already getting help. Um, there, there are some situations where we have a little bit of flexibility if there's a, you know, if it's clear that there's unmet need um, after that person has received services through another agency, we can consider. Um, but in most cases, we would limit uh, the services to those people who aren't getting any help from any other agency. Now, it is possible for somebody to receive VA services as well as Medicaid services, community attendance services. So I would suggest calling the Aging and Disability Resource Center. And again, um, that benefit specialist can help you kind of uh, talk through the situation and any programs that may be available. Great. I think we've gotten to, um, to all of them. I, um, Courtney, I'm going to go ahead and include your link to services, community resources um, in the follow-up email. I know some people asked about resources and resource directories, but I'll um, 
add that to the follow up email so you can all have the link. Donnie and Courtney, thank you so very much. I don't know if you had anything else you want to add before we close out. We just appreciate you being with us this morning. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining us, and you all have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.